Welcome. I'm Tina Cassidy, Chief Marketing Officer at GBH and a former journalist and author. Thank you for joining us for our 10th edition of our monthly Beyond the Page Book Club. Today, I'll be joined by Leonard Downey Jr., Executive Editor of the Washington Post from 1991 to 2008, managing the newsroom during some of the most influential stories of our time. First, I'd like to give special recognition to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who has partnered with us at the Beyond the Book Club page, Beyond the Page Book Club for this event. Trident's open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store for browsing. Visit them between 8 and 9 a.m., seven days a week, or on their website 24-7. Before we get started, started, I wanted to explain how this will all work. I know you may be new to Zoom, uh, you won't see yourself on the video, and you will not be able to speak during the interview with Len. But we do wanna hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put in your questions at any point in time during my interview with Len, and I'll include them throughout the discussion, mostly towards the end. You don't need to wait for the second half of the event to start typing in your questions, so feel free to get started now. See a question that you want to hear the answer to? Vote for it by clicking the thumbs up and move it up to the top of the list. We'll do our best to ask the most, most popular questions when they come up. In addition, Zoom has recently rolled out an automated captioning feature, and we are excited to now be able to offer this so that everyone can enjoy our events. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription displays will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript, a sidebar window open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed and sometimes it makes mistakes. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Leonard Downey Jr. and discuss his new book, All About the Story, News, Power, Politics, and the Washington Post. Len spent his entire 44-year career at the Post in roles that included investigative reporter, London correspondent, and Metro editor. He covered everything from the Jonestown massacre to the troubles in Northern Ireland, to the Iran hostage crisis and the downfalls of figures such as Marion Barry and Gary Hart. As Metro editor, he also oversaw a local burglary story reported by Woodward and Bernstein called Watergate. Len was the executive editor of the Post from 91 to 2008, during which time he oversaw everything from Bill Clinton's impeachment to 9-11, the Iraq war, the Great Recession, and so much more. He's the author of many books, including The New Muckrakers, The News About the News, and the novel The Rules of the Game. He's now the Weill Family Professor of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State's Cronkite School of Journalism. Welcome, Len. Thank you, Tina. Okay, this feels like an important time to talk about not only the post and your career at the center of its storied history, but also its recent past under the ownership of Jeff Bezos and its future with the announcement last month that Marty Barron is stepping down as executive editor. And of course, there's the state of journalism to discuss. So let's jump in. Investigative journalism is the beating heart of a free press. The first wave of investigative journalism came during the progressive era in the early 1900s. You were part of the second wave in the 1960s when a new generation was questioning everything. As founder of Investigative Reporters and Editors, the premier national trade organization for this kind of work, how would you characterize the state of contemporary investigative journalism? which seems to range from citizen journalists with a podcast or a Substack newsletter to serious nonprofit organizations such as ProPublica to partisan websites such as Project Veritas. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'll start back when I was a young investigative reporter in the 1960s, there wasn't very much investigative reporting anymore in the United States. 
after the two world wars and the depression and the Vietnam War and the McCarthy era. Uh, investigative reporting had kind of died out nationally and there are only some local investigative reporters and newspapers around the country doing the kind of work I did as a young reporter. Watergate changed everything. As a result of the Watergate investigation and the book, All the President's Men, and especially the movie, All the President's Men, uh, many journalists wanted to be investigative reporters and most newspapers, television stations, television networks decided they should have investigative reporters and it's been going great guns ever since. It has become, as you said, an essential part of American journalism. Um, but it keeps changing and it keeps changing because uh, many newspapers are now much smaller than they were before. And while many of them still continue to have some kinds of investigative reporting going on with the smaller staff, it is more difficult for them to do so. Stepping into the breach have been a number of non new nonprofit investigative reporting sites nationally, like something called ProPublica headquartered in New York, state ones like Texas Tribune in, in Texas, uh, local ones like the Voice of San Diego in San Diego, uh, for example. Uh, and so, so that, that's spreading across the country is another place for investigative reporters to go. And also with the internet, of course, anybody can be an investigative reporter. Anybody can post something that they find out <clears throat> and or investigative reporters can use the help of citizens who wanna, who wanna help them out. Uh, one of the, uh, David uh, Farenthold of the Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize investigative reporter, uh, utilize the audience uh, to help him investigate uh, Donald Trump's foundation and his businesses and his golf courses by literally going on Twitter and holding up his notebook to show what he knew so far and with the questions that he wanted to ask the audience to help him with. And he got help from all around the country, including people that work for the Trump organization. So th that has vastly changed it. Now, you also brought up something like Project Veritas. Some of what masquerades as investigative reporting is not true. It's propaganda or in the case of uh, Project Veritas attempts to trap people into false to false things. And so uh, the audience needs to be careful uh, as it goes through the internet and finds what looks like investigative reporting to make sure that it's for real. Let's talk about Woodward and Bernstein. It was really interesting to read how different they were as human beings and in their approach to reporting and writing. You even say Woodward was wooden as a writer. What was it like to edit their copy? And for those who have never worked in a newsroom, explain the mechanics and the time pressures entailed. Would there right. be shouting and swearing? <laughs> well, this is before the internet. So it was a newspaper only time, newspaper and television, obviously. Uh, but the newspaper had, had very large circulation. So it had many editions uh, through the night uh, to serve everybody in the morning with newspapers on their doorsteps. Our first deadline was around uh, 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night for presses that would start rolling around 10 o'clock. Uh, and so that was our deadline. But we also could go back into those stories later, or if a story broke later, and I'll give you an example of that later, uh, we could still make, we still put a new story into the newspaper paper as late as one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and so uh, I, I inherited editing. I, I, I was part of the chain of command supervising Watergate stories at first. And then after the editor who had been directly editing Bob and Carl went off to write a book, I then edited Bob and Carl directly and the rest of our investigative reporting for all of 1973 and 1974 until Richard Nixon resigned. Um, as I said in the book, uh, uh, Carl was a, was a natural writer, a terrific writer and a good storyteller who liked to jump to conclusions about things. I mean, he, he, he thought Nixon was going to resign long before the rest of us did, uh, very much longer. Uh, and he'd make sure that we didn't have, there was nothing in his uh, drafts of stories that might indicate that he thought that. Uh, Bob is very, was very careful, we one step at a time. And as a result, they often disagreed over when a story was ready to go into the newspaper. And often I would have to step in and, and uh, uh, referee those disagreements. And ultimately, sometimes one would turn in a version of the story and the other would turn in another version of the story. And I would have to take my, get, go on my, my typewriter uh, and type out a, a, a version that would be satisfactory uh, to both of them and most importantly uh, to me. Uh, so not, not a lot of shouting. I'm not a shouter. They weren't shouters, but they did have their disagreements. But they, went, they, they didn't want to have that scene. I think as they said in their own book, uh, uh, all, the presidents, uh, all the President's Men, they would go off to the, uh, to the, to the snack bar in the back of the newsroom uh, and argue back there out, out, of, our, out of our presence. Uh, so that just so we wouldn't see that. And they were and they were good friends, obviously, and, and lifelong friends as they still are today. It's fascinating to read about that. 
The section in your book about deep throat was also fascinating. Tell us about the procedures you had in place to ensure deep throat was real and how sourcing policies may differ from news outlet to news outlet even today. Explain to us what the standards are. Right. The standards are that uh, obviously you want to have somebody on the record as much as they could be and be able to use their name in the newspaper. That makes it more believable for readers. Uh, if for some reason, as, it was, as was the case with dozens of sources in Watergate, they were afraid they would lose their jobs or worse. And so they did not want their names used in the newspaper. They wanted to speak to us as confidential sources. And so then you have, you, have, you make a, essentially a contract with them, an, an unwritten contract, that you're going to keep their, their names confidential, but you can use the information they give you. And in Bob and Carl's case, they promised confidentiality for the life of the source, unless the source at some point in the future uh, decided to release them from their confidentiality pledge. Uh, and so uh, it, well, we required them because of the sensitive nature of Watergate uh, to write out notes about uh, write notes about on all their interviews uh, and to put at the top of the, each page uh, the name of the source, the name of the confidential source. So I knew who dozens of their confidential sources were, literally going all the way up to Alexander Haig when he was chief of staff of Richard Nixon, was one of their confidential sources named at the top of the page. When Bob interviewed Deep Throat, we, we, we allowed him to make Deep Throat the one source that we would, that we, we would, that his editors would not have to know the name of uh, because it was such a sensitive thing. Uh, Mark Felt, who was Deep Throat, was number two in the FBI at the time and was so sensitive, he was so chary of speaking with Bob uh, that, we, that we allowed that agreement. Uh, but, but as a result, we never used anything in the newspaper just from Deep Throat at all. We used him for leads and for and for a kind of uh, 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 telling telling Bob when he was on the wrong track, but nothing was published actually just from him, uh, and that was a, that was an important difference. But the other the other use of confidential sources is the same as it is today, and and eventually decades later, after a lot of bad guesses from people, including me, about who Deep Throat might really be, uh, um, his his identity was revealed by his family in Vanity Fair magazine because they could not convince Bob that Deep Throat was uh, uh, was was uh, he, he was ill, and then he was able to actually himself agree uh, to uh, to uh, uh, for Bob to break break the confidential source uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, as a result, people would often ask me when I spoke publicly, "Weren't you upset that you were scooped?" By Vanity Fair, and I said quite the contrary. Uh, the fact that we uh, that we were scooped by Vanity Fair showed that we kept our promise. Bob kept his promise uh, un until then, and, and that every Washington Post reporter who assures us a confidential source of a promise of confidentiality will be believed. All right, let's switch gears and talk about your time as London correspondent. You covered so many big moments there, including the wedding of uh, Prince Charles and Lady Diana, and yet so many news outlets have closed their foreign bureaus in the last 15 years with freelancers filling the void, often in quite dangerous environments. What's the state of foreign correspondence? That's a good and important question. When I was a London correspondent of the Post, uh, there were so many London correspondents from newspapers all over the United States and television networks and so on that we had an American Correspondents Association with probably 40, 50 members. And we even had Prince Charles to dinner when I was the president of the Correspondents uh, Association. What did he eat? What, what did he, I can't or remember. What did you serve? I can't remember what we served anymore, uh, but what I do remember is I to talk about in the book is that he was uh, he was relaxed to be in the presence of Americans, because he, he felt he had to be on all the time when he was dealing with uh, with British people he was going around you know shaking people's hands and things, uh, and he could let down his hair with us. Uh, uh, and and the other thing that struck me is that he was kind of a sad guy because if you think about it, he he cannot assume his job, the job he was born for, to be king of of Britain, Great Britain, until his mother died which is a horrible position to be in. Uh, and then, of course, she still is alive uh, and uh, nearing 100, and he still is not king. And so he didn't really have a job. I mean, that was a lot of what we talked about. Uh, but um, uh, but we, there were so many correspondents then, but his newspapers got smaller, as I said, but with the internet coming along and taking advertising away from newspapers. Uh, and, and the cost of being abroad was, uh, was had gotten so much more expensive. Some of those cities are the most expensive cities in the world. 
And as a result of fewer full-time correspondents for, in fact, almost none for newspapers outside of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the networks now have more correspondents than ever before because they've managed to become multimedia news organizations in the internet age. But as a result, then more, as you said, more stringers, what we call stringers are out there who are essentially freelancers who go to trouble spots in the world or various countries that they're very interested in, establish a relationship with the news organization organization where they're trusted, where their work is trusted to be accurate and fair uh, and, uh, and readable. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 they, and they have filled that void of, uh, of the lack of full-time foreign correspondence that used to be the case. Speaking of Charles and Diana, you spend a lot of time in this book talking about the ethics of covering the private lives of public figures in the era of the Kardashians and Stormy Daniels. Do people even care? Um, that's another good question. <laughs> journalists still care. That is to yeah. say, journalists outside of uh, uh, outside of the of the uh, kinds of places that are dealing with the Kardashians all the time, for example. Uh, uh, and there's there's always been that kind of uh, you know rumor kind of coverage of uh, of celebrities. Uh, but um, uh, but when you're dealing with politicians. Uh, when you're dealing with pre presidents of the United States, candidates to be president, candidates for other public office, public office holders. Uh, you've seen this in the Me Too era, for example, uh, where there's, a, there's a, a welcome examination of the behavior of men in power towards women. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to be sure that's accurate. You, you don't, you don't want to ruin somebody's reputation and career with something that's false. Uh, and, and also, by the way, if you did that, then people would not believe the important stories about, about this. Uh, and so you still need to have that same care uh, that I took then. I, I had a rule for how we did this. Uh, first of all, is, the, is what we've been told true? Because people are always spreading rumors, particularly about politicians. Their enemies are spreading rumors about them. And so it may not be true. Often it turned out not to be true when we checked it out. But secondly, if it is true, uh, then can we prove it? Can we prove it to our readers? Uh, you know, we may feel it in our guts that it's true, uh, but we don't have enough proof to go into print with it. And then thirdly, if it is true <clears throat> and we can prove that it's true, is it really relevant to their performance as candidates or public office or corporate presidents or so on? And, uh, and th those, are the, uh, those are the gates that we had to take stories through before deciding whether- And the you have to check all three of those boxes, not all just- All three one. of those boxes, that's correct. Yeah. You say in your book that you didn't vote when you were at the Post because you wanted to preserve your nonpartisan, unbiased approach to this extreme. Do you vote now? Uh, yes, I do. I, I live in the District of Columbia, so I'm registered to vote in the District of Columbia. I'm registered no party because I'm still not partisan. Uh, and I also know that people were watching to see if I was how I was going to register. People who thought that the, you know, the post was too liberal or the post was too conservative. I must be a Democrat. I must be a Republican. Uh, and so, in fact, on the day that my retirement became final, my wife went online <coughs> to register me to vote in the District of Columbia. And the very next day, a local website um, said, Len Downey's registered to vote in the District of Columbia. And That's I've been great. voting ever since. Well, I'd love to have you read a related passage uh, now for us. Can you turn to page 241 in your book? Yes. It's a, it's a great passage. Thank you. Yeah. As Ben had, I insisted on complete nonpartisanship in the Post news coverage and non-involvement of Post journalists in political activity or advocacy of any kind. The newsroom standards and ethics policy, which I strictly enforced, required our journalists to, quote, avoid active involvement in any partisan causes, politics, community affairs, social action, demonstrations that could compromise our ability to report and edit fairly. That meant that, meant that members of the new staff could not contribute money to candidates, parties, or causes, could not sign petitions, or participate in any of the many protest marches in Washington. I stopped voting when I became managing editor in 1984, although I did not require other post journalists to do the same. That was the one political act they could perform was to vote. As the final decision maker in the post news coverage, I did not want to decide even privately who should be president <clears throat> or hold any other public office or what position I should take on public issue policy issues. I wanted my mind to remain open to all sides and possibilities. I know that sounds unlikely or naive, but I can really see all sides and possibilities in most issues. 
so much so that it often frustrates my much more opinionated wife, Janice. I asked her permission to read this part. I believe that my open mind made it easier for me to pursue and direct aggressive reporting that held all kinds of officials and institutions accountable. I believe that the journalist's role as a singular kind of citizen is to inform other citizens as truthfully and impartially as possible about what they need to know to participate effectively in civic life. Today, especially with all the accusations of news media bias, it is more important than ever for truth-seeking journalists to avoid all appearances of bias and to let their work speak for itself. It needs to be all about the story. It sure does. Thanks, Len. That's wonderful. As a reminder, if you want to ask Len questions, use the Q&A tab that's located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions tonight, and don't forget to vote up questions that you would like to have answered. Now it's time to take a quick break and hear from Sarah, volunteer and fundraising coordinator about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only with Beyond the Page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Tina. And thanks everyone uh, for spending time with us during tonight's Beyond the Page event. There's something so special about a community of people brought together by a book. The great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free. GBH is member supported, and that means we're here because you want us to be here. Our commercial free status also means we can count on your support. If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive an autographed copy of next month's featured book, The Stationery Shop by Marjin Kamali. GBH and Beyond the Page aim to serve our audience in a way that not only educates, but also entertains, inspires, and shares diverse perspectives. We rely on financial support from members to keep offering programs like virtual events like this one. So please give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or give $60 all at once, whatever works for your budget. And tonight we have two ways for you to give. You can visit wgbh.org slash support events, or you can just text GBH to 800-492-1111 to make a donation right from your cell phone. And that's texting GBH to 800-492-1111, or I'm sure it just popped up in the chat, so you can go ahead and look there. And to those attendees who are already GBH members, thanks so much for your support. And now back to Tina with more. Thanks, Sarah. It's time to continue our discussion with Len Downey Jr. Remember to use the Q&A function. No need to wait, jump right in and ask your questions. I see there's a great question here from Lynn who asks, who was the most difficult person you interviewed? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, it, it depends on what you talk about the degree of difficulty. I, okay. I, I would say the most difficult was also the most rewarding and the most interesting for me, which was Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Britain. Uh, I, I, I arrived in London just in time to cover her first election, the beginning of the Thatcher era in, in Britain, which started in 1979. She was, uh, she was a, a very aggressive uh, prime minister. Uh, she was uh, very conservative. She wanted, to, she wanted to change the British welfare system uh, and uh, create a different kind of, of, of country uh, and went about it very aggressively. And she started, and, and she started this war with, uh, with Argentina over the islands called the Falkland Islands at the bottom of South America, which was a British possession that the Argentinians had invaded and wanted to take over. They've always disputed that it was British. <coughs> and towards the end of my time in London, uh, she, the, 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 the British had sent a big invasion force down there and the Reagan administration had a problem, the United States Reagan, Ronald Reagan administration had a problem uh, because both Argentina and Britain were uh, allies. Uh, and uh, so they tried to convince her to somehow settle uh, the war with Argentina, where she wanted to insist on unconditional surrender. So she used an interview with me to, take, to send the message to Washington that she would only accept an unconditional surrender. 
uh, and uh, that, 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 that created a very uh, interesting interview. We were sitting in a small ante room in uh, your office in, in Downing Street, uh, just the two of us on two chairs facing each other very closely. It was an unusually uh, warm day in London and there was no uh, uh, air conditioning in Downing Street at the time. She's on the edge of her chair, I'm on the edge of my chair. We both begin to sweat. Uh, somewhat profusely, and as, as was her way, every question I asked, she argued with. Would she like doing that, arguing with reporters' questions before finally answering them? And once she, once she got going and got her message across about the Falklands War, I realized that we were having a, a real conversation, a real aggressive, interesting conversation, uh, and uh, and that she, she wasn't ready to stop. So we went way over the time of, of allotted for the interview, and I began asking her about all sorts of other uh, things that I wanted to ask her about, her attitude towards the well welfare state. She said she was, I said, what, uh, you, does it bother you that people think you want to turn back Britain to Victorian times? And she said, I'm proud to be a Victorian lady. And as usual, I say my very last question, uh, I say for the last question, the one that I thought might end the interview, uh, which was, um, uh, Prime Minister, uh, you're the first woman Prime Minister in Britain. You're the first woman leader of the Conservative Party, which is notably not a, not a very pleasant place for women to be in. Uh, and uh, uh, when I talk to women around Britain in, in, as a reporter, uh, they all say how proud they are of that. But at the same time, they say, why aren't there more women in your cabinet? Why aren't you doing more for the women of Britain? And she got really close to me at the edge of her chair and said, I earned it, they can earn it. <laughs> wow. So that was a difficult interview, but a very rewarding one. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, we have another question here from Anonymous who says, I enjoyed the book. I'm curious why there is such limited information on the impact on your personal life. I know it must have been very difficult. I actually think you shared a fair amount about your personal life, but I'll <laughs> let you answer the question. Yes, I, 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 I thought I did too. Uh, but, uh, you know, the impact of my personal life was profound, as I say in the book. Uh, uh, it, uh, I, I was devoted to journalism. And uh, uh, I, I don't want to say that's my first love. My, my wife is my first love. Uh, but, uh, but it was very demanding. And so for my first two marriages, it actually was difficult. Uh, we had children, children to be raised. I, my, my hours were long. I never had dinner with my family on a work day. Never, ever. And when I look back on that, I think just how unfair that was, both to, both to uh, my wives and my children. Uh, and uh, so it was, it was very difficult and not much social life outside either. I, I was not one of those journalists in Washington who attended all the fancy dinners and, and the parties and so on, uh, because I didn't see any point to it. I didn't see, it, it, I only went to those where I thought I could actually learn something important for the newspaper and not the ones who were simply socializing with the same people all the time. I tell my students now, I say, this is a really great profession to go in, but it's not a job, it's a mission. It's a mission for your life. And if you decide to go on that mission, you probably are gonna to have to sacrifice some of your personal life, some of your social life, some of your family life. That's the way journalism is. So true. There is a question here from Dan who says, Len, you are well known for not voting because you believed it would compromise your neutrality. I wonder if you could talk about that in the context of the current environment, a democratic party that hasn't changed all that much and a Republican party that has embraced authoritarianism and false conspiracy theories. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a lifelong devotee of investigative reporting, and I really appreciate the really strong investigative reporting that much of the news media has done about exactly those issues uh, in the uh, in, in the in the Trump administration and 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 the Trump the Trump followers in the Republican Party. So I'm still not going to express an opinion about that, but it's clearly something that needs to be investigated, held accountable to the American people, and then the American people decide what to do about that. And uh, it's not my job to persuade them one way or the other. Uh, following on the heels of that, we've got a related question from Carolyn, who asks, how would you have reported the events of January 6th? What a story. Yes, well, much the way in which, in fact, the Washington Post and, and other news media have reported it, uh, there's still much to do. There's still much to investigate about exactly who was there uh, and uh, what kind of planning there was, why there wasn't, uh, why the intelligence about the possibility of, of, of trouble uh, was not uh, was not heeded by the by the authorities at the time, uh, um, uh, how high up into uh, into um, you know the 
politics uh, did uh, did uh, the encouragement go? Uh, to what extent was the was the the lies that were being told by politicians about the uh, about the election? Uh, uh, affected uh, the the people who did this rioting and did, did this destruction, uh, and we're going to find out more about it as the authorities keep investigating and as as journalists keep investigating alongside them. The volume of material for investigative reporters um, from that day is remarkable. Yes, it reminds me in terms of volume. A lo, a lo, uh, it reminds me of 9/11, obviously, when for the for that the next day that that day the next day and many days thereafter, uh, the volume of what we were doing in our newsroom, all hands on deck, uh, was so immense, and that included investigative reporting too. We began our investigative reporting of how how and why that happened immediately. Right. Tom asks, could you elaborate on your relationship with Ben Bradley, particularly during the advancement of your career? Right. Uh, I, 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 a lot of what happened in my career uh, uh, was 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 accidental. Uh, ben Bradley was a brand new editor at the a brand new editor of the Washington Post. He had been there earlier as a young reporter covering the local courts uh, and police and so on a, a d decades earlier. But then he came back as the editor of the newspaper. And my city editor at the time, this, I just was a very young reporter, only my second year, I think, in the newsroom. And the city editor at the time, along with Ben, had also covered that local court when a few years earlier. So the two of them knew that this local court, which was then called the Court of General Sessions, was a mess, was really terrible. And they sent me down there. I didn't ask for it. I didn't even know about it. They just sent me down there, not to cover the court day in and day out, but to see what I could find out about what was wrong with it and what the Post ought to do about it. And that evolved into a year-long investigation that produced in which I produced a seven part series about what was wrong with the court. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, the Johnson administration, which was interested in court reform, abolished the Court of General Sessions and replaced it with what is today the DC Superior Court, a much better criminal court in Washington. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, I became an investigative reporter uh, for many years, uh, for several years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Ben, um, uh, acknowledged my, my work, but he wasn't terribly interested in investigative reporting. Uh, so that was a primary, the contact I had with him then. Uh, but then as time went on, uh, and uh, he, for instance, wanted to have, uh, uh, he wanted to remove the current post correspondent in London in, in 1979, who refused to leave after having been there eight and a half years. I had been the Metro editor after Watergate, so he figured by sending a senior editor over to take his place, he'd have to leave, which is what happened. Uh, so, that, that, so I got to know Ben you know, better then. Uh, and then when I came back, uh, I was a, a national editor. Uh, and um, uh, and, and ben, um, ben respected what I did, but I was not one of his buddies. He, 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 liked, he, he, was, he liked to have friends in the newsroom. I was not a close friend. Uh, and uh, so when it came time to replace the, uh, the, re the managing editor of the paper who was leaving the newspaper, uh, he, he thought that he, he called me into his office and said his idea was to have uh, three of us become the managing editor co-managing editors to see who might be the best one in doing the job. And one of them was a close pal of his named uh, Shelby Coffey, a really talented editor, who was one of the great editors of the style section of the Post. And another was Jim Hogan, who was an outstanding foreign correspondent and foreign editor. And the third was me. Uh, and uh, I told him, we, we can't do that. I, I, I can't do that to them. That's just not, I, I, I'd rather not have the job uh, than to go through something like that. And I went away and uh, sometime later, he called me back some weeks later. Uh, in fact, he took me out to lunch and offered me the job. And what I discovered when I was doing the reporting on my book is that Don Graham, uh, the publisher of the newspaper who had known me ever since I was a young editor on the city desk and he was a young reporter working for me uh, during his time of doing various jobs at the Post uh, that he had told Ben that uh, he wanted me to have the job uh, because he wanted somebody who, could, who he thought could succeed Ben later. That's Great. Uh, Lynn I has a question. I should, add, I should add, though, that Ben and I were pals. We became pals. And uh, and uh, I, I, I used him. I, I sought his advice often uh, during my time as executive editor. Sure. And uh, Ben's book, uh, A Good Life, is also a really great read, which I recommend. Um, Lynn says that she read Catherine Graham's autobiography, which is also an awesome book, um, Personal History. And she said that she loved the book. And during that time, the Post decided to publish what they knew 
Can you describe, I think she's talking about uh, the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. Um, can you describe the anxiety around that decision? Yes, it's interesting. At that time, I was on the city desk. Like I said, I was a local a city, a local assistant city editor on the city to staff at that time. Uh, and so I was not involved with the national staff <coughs> or the foreign staff that was covering the Vietnam War. Uh, and I was not privy to, uh, I, I, the first I knew about the Pentagon Papers was when the New York Times started publishing stories about them. And then of course, the courts, uh, Nixon and the courts intervened, uh, stopped the Times of publishing after three days. Uh, and I didn't know that Ben that Ben Bagdikian, a senior editor at the Post, had also obtained copies of the Pentagon Papers after that, and that they were, Ben Ben Bradley took them to his house, uh, and uh, uh, and in one day they made well, he assembled a bunch of uh, experts on the staff so that one day they could produce stories the very next day based on the Pentagon Papers, after Mrs. Graham made a very difficult decision to go ahead and allow them to be published. Uh, which was very difficult because the post at that time was just gone public, being offered to the public as a public corporation. Uh, her her lawyers advised her against it. Her business executives advised against it, and she very bravely said that uh, she was going to. She said, uh, told Ben that he could go ahead, uh, go ahead and publish. It's, and that uh, by the way, was exactly one year before Watergate, before the Watergate break-in. It was a busy time. <laughs> Um, another anonymous question. The networks these days all seem to be more interested in opinion rather than news. What can be done to reverse this trend? Yeah, this is, um, I talk some about this in, in my book, um, uh, uh, in the after, afterward part of the book. Um, I, 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 there's, been, there's been a lot of evolution since my time as executive editor of the Post in, uh, in um uh, what's called voice in journalism and, and interpretation. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that expert reporters are able to show more of their expertise in their stories, help readers understand what's really going on uh, through, through analysis in their stories. I'm concerned when it looks like it's verging into personal opinion, whether it's in a newspaper or on television. Uh, and uh, you know, CNN, for example, I find does a lot of great original reporting, very good original reporting. But at the same time, there's a lot of opinion mixed into its presentation, which I think uh, reduces the, the credibility of that really great reporting. Uh, not to mention what goes on in Fox News, where a lot of it isn't even accurate reporting. Uh, and so, uh, and then the other thing that's happened is, uh, and, and, and that seems to attract audience. So, you know, this opinion seems to attract audience uh, on on on, uh, on, telev on cable television. At the same time, in uh, in fact finding uh, news organizations like the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, the, there's been a demand to have those reporters appear on television, on cable television, on network television, uh, and, uh, and, and to talk about their stories and to talk about what they're finding out. And they're, they often are put on along with people that are expressing opinions, very strong opinions on both sides of the issue. And so it's difficult for the audience to be able to discern that the reporter really is talking facts and the others are talking opinions, but it looks all mixed up to the audience. And, and I, I worry about that. Kate asks, print newspapers all over the country are in trouble financially, which particular, which particularly impacts serious local news reporting. Do you think print journalism will survive? Uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to, <laughs> uh, and I'm speaking as a, as a lifelong print journalist. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, uh, titles I wondered about for my book is called The Newspaper Man, and my publisher convinced me that, uh, you know, nobody but 70-year-olds would read that book <laughs> with a title like that. So, uh, and, and he's right, because uh, The Washington Post is no longer a newspaper. Uh, New York Times is no longer a newspaper. Each of them is a multimedia, multi-platform, national and worldwide news organization that also happens to still print newspapers. And they'll contribute to print newspapers for as long as there are old people who still want to read them. That number is diminishing all the time, but it's still in the hundreds of thousands for both newspapers. But eventually it may end. It may, may just dry up. Meanwhile, uh, the Washington Post, I think, has two and a half million worldwide uh, uh, internet subscribers. The New York Times may have five million worldwide internet subscribers. And those local newspapers around the country that are able to, to make that kind of transition, I think the Boston Globe is one of them, uh, by, 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 by having paid for subscriptions, are making up for uh, the loss of revenue in advertising as a result of the internet taking so much of the advertising away. 
uh, and at the same time, uh, some of these newspapers, the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, uh, the Boston Globe, uh, I forget the name of the rich owner of the Boston Globe, the billionaire. John Henry. Yes, uh, and the uh, Star Tribune in Minneapolis and a couple other newspapers around the country have been bought by local billionaires who really care about the future of news uh, and, are, and are helping them, are spending the money to transition them into becoming multimedia news organizations. As I said, there are also these nonprofits springing up around the country, uh, but some newspapers are gonna die. Uh, however, uh, uh, local news is a particular concern to me because uh, th that's very important news for all Americans local uh, and um, so I'm looking into the fact that not only are there nonprofits starting up locally around the country, but also there are foundations and other organizations that are uh, helping them financially, helping newspapers financially to make the transition. So we're in, we're, we're in transition now, <laughs> and uh, and I'm not I don't know exactly how it's going to come out, uh, but this is a very important time for that. There's a relatively new organization called Report for America, sort yeah. of like Teach for America, but for journalism. It embeds a reporter in local newsrooms uh, throughout the country, and they've scaled pretty quickly, just showing how great the need is uh, across America. Right, and they, and and it is also you know membership is growing for uh, nonprofit news organizations, and some and some a few a few newspapers are becoming nonprofits also, That's right. uh, and. Uh, um, so it, it really is going to be up to like listeners like you and, uh, and, and readers around the country to help support uh, the news media. Roy asks, as a teacher at ASU, what do you think of the quality of journalism students, especially those interested in investigative work? I'm extremely impressed by it, really, really impressed by it. Uh, um, uh, a lot of really bright young people are still getting into this, uh, getting into journalism, uh, coming to journalism school to get into journalism. They are very committed to journalism and journalism in various forms because now you know, there's also podcasts, which interest some, some students especially. Uh, there's all kinds of video things going on that interest the students especially. So some of that, some of those new skills and those new technologies help increase the interest in journalism beyond just newspapers and, and uh, broadcast television. Uh, but, but I, I I, particularly in investigative reporting, which is the only thing I teach, I'm finding really motivated upperclassmen and, and master students who are who are very much motivated to become investigative reporters, who are picking up what they need to learn rapidly, who are paying attention to the professional journalists, professional investigative reporters and editors uh, that I bring into my classes as guests, and are beginning to do, while they're in school, good investigative reporting work. So I'm very excited about the future of investigative reporting in terms of the people who want to do it. Carol asks, could you comment on Trump's attack on the press and its effect on news organizations? Thank you, Carol. That, that enables me to, uh, to uh, uh, make a little pitch for something. Uh, there's something called the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is a very, very important organization interested in uh, journalism around the United States and around the world, and particularly protecting journalists who are physically in trouble, but also journalism that's in trouble everywhere. And so I did a report for them in 2013 about the Obama administration in the press, uh, in which um, uh, in which I, I made clear that while he said he was gonna have the most transparent uh, administration in American history, he didn't. He managed the news very tightly. Uh, he did not attack the press the way uh, Trump does, but he made it difficult for the press to do their jobs, to hold the administration accountable. And I, and I, and I detailed and also uh, by the end, also investigated and prosecuted sources of the confidential of, of, of government information in some cases to the press. Uh, and then uh, in 2020, I, I, I published another report to the Committee to Protect Journalists about the Trump administration in the press, and it was all about those attacks in the press, uh, which, which was a, really an attack on the press's role in the American democracy. Uh, thanks for putting up cpj.org there. You can go there and see both of those reports. I'm now going to, I've now started work on a report on how the Biden administration deals with the press in its first year in office following on the Trump administration. But it was obviously terribly uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, to the future of uh, and credibility of American press, the attacks that not just Trump, but all of his followers uh, 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 carried out during those four years and his followers continue to carry out now. He continues to carry out now and has convinced a, a large part of the country, a majority of Republicans and, and uh, a substantial amount of Americans generally uh, to not believe the news media. And this is really very dangerous to the future of the Republic. 
We have another question here from Anonymous who asks, what's something that you wish people knew about working in journalism? Uh, that we that those of us who are engaged in fact-finding journalism and the, all the people doing that throughout the country are, 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 have devoted their lives to that, to the mission of fact-finding journalism uh, and not to opinion and not to partisanship <clears throat> and to understand that those, those are the discussions in newsrooms. Uh, publishers do not dictate, except for a few bad, bad apples, do not dictate what goes into the newspaper. The editorial page does not dictate what goes into the newspaper. Opinion is separate. The editorial page is separate from the rest of the newspaper and most newspapers, uh, as it is in broadcasts, some broadcasts. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, that people are worried about doing their jobs well and informing the American people. Uh, and that's what pervades newsrooms. And that's what the newsroom conversations are about. That's what our lives are about. And I'd like people to be able to see that. And a little plug for the book, that's why I wrote this book, uh, is to take people inside my newsroom uh, from the time I was a reporter all through being executive editor to see what we're really thinking and doing inside a newsroom that you don't often get to see when you see the stories. The question about students coming up today, um, you know, they're incredibly smart and, uh, you know, dedicated. They also bring other qualities to the table that, that are somewhat new. You know, they're bringing their whole self to the job, yeah. right? That, that it's not just, this is my job during the day, but, um, you know, their, ho their whole identity is, is part of uh, their work. And, um, you know, because of that, um, they, you know, they can't, they, they don't think that their private lives can be separated from their professional lives. If you were still executive editor, um, you know, if you were still executive editor uh, last summer, would you have told your black reporters and their white allies that they could not march in a Black Lives Matter protest? Yes. I would say their responsibility is to get out there and not only cover the protests, but to cover the reason why there are protests. Uh, to investigate racism in the United States, uh, to to investigate police brutality, as as many journalists did, but not to, but not to march in the demonstrations. As I said, as I said in the passage I read from the book, uh, uh, journalists are are a different kind of citizen. We give up certain rights that all other citizens have in order to exercise our very profound right under the First Amendment to to be very very aggressive journalists. Now that that's having said that. Nevertheless, within news organizations, there are issues about diversity, for example, and there's no reason why within the news organization, why uh, 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 journalists who work for that organization cannot be, should be active uh, in making sure that that news organization is as diverse as it can be, not only in its makeup, but in its, in its coverage. And that's, and that's the way that you work out your concerns about those things is within the news organization itself. And, and I should I should say something about the, you know, the post, what I read earlier about the post rules for journalists still stand today. It doesn't cover, I never said anything about social media in there because social media was not yet a part of that policy all those, all those decades. Right. And, but that raises a new question as to what you say on social media. And, uh, I, 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 and they're, they're trying to figure that out uh, at, at, at many, many news organizations now. Uh, and uh, what I do tell my students though, is that um, uh, your social media activity is part of your permanent record. Even those, even those uh, social media that theoretically erase what you've done is never permanently erased. People can find it. People can find it very easily. And indeed, we saw during the last campaign that the Trump, the Trump campaign hired people who went through the social media records of, of uh, journalists to try to say, see, aha, this person's biased, this person's biased. And so you want to, you want to be very careful about that. You want to give up you want to give up some of your rights, even as a social person, uh, in order to join together uh, with, a, with your fellow journalists in carrying out their, that important work. Maria asks, can you speak to the tension between the newsroom and the opinion pages? Yeah, no, no, yeah, not much tension at all, where, where it's well established that there's a difference. At the Washington Post, the editor of the editorial page, a really fine, outstanding journalist named Fred Hyatt now, and Part of the time I was executive editor. Before that, there were other fine ex editorial page editors. They're in charge of the editorial page. They're in charge of all those columns on the op-ed page. In fact, the Post now has two op-ed pages, one, one of which comes before the editorial page. And they're clearly labeled. They're clearly labeled as opinion. 
uh, and uh, they have nothing to do, the, the, the editors and the writers on the editorial page have nothing to do with the news coverage in the newsroom, and it, we in the newsroom have nothing to do with the editorial page's opinions. I never sat in an editorial page meeting, I never expressed an opinion to the editorial page, and they never were in any of our meetings in the newsroom. We sometimes would share information if we heard a hot tip, you know, you want to share a hot tip, uh, but that's not, that's not, uh, you know, opinion involving an opinion. So an example, for instance, is that uh, we, there's a mayor in Washington named Marion Barry, who probably many of your audience recognize that name. He was an outstanding mayor for his first couple terms and then became, as often happens with somebody who's elected again and again, a, a lot of questions were raised about his behavior, including his private behavior. Uh, we were able to discover through investigative reporting that he was taking drugs and, uh, and, and uh, associating with uh, with people who took drugs, among other things, uh, and, uh, uh, and and other problems of contracting and hiring and so on. But the editorial page continued to endorse him. And so I think it was the third or fourth time he ran, and they were endorsing him again, and we were you know conducting this very vigorous investigative reporting. Somebody who I will not name, senior on the editorial page, came into the newsroom and said, why do you keep doing this investigative reporting when we've endorsed this man for mayor? And I said, get the hell out of my newsroom and don't come back again. And he did. Good answer. Uh, Kate wants to know what your relationship was like with Kay Graham. Well, it was wonderful. Um, I, I will indulge in a little personal uh, uh, experience about that, which is in the book. Uh, uh, well, for, first of all, as a young as a young investigative reporter, uh, she followed my work. Occasionally, she called me uh, called me up into her office to tell me how much she uh, liked my work. Uh, and then when I was on the city desk, and then when I was later Metro editor in charge of all the local coverage, uh, she would provide tips. She once was driving past a, a, a part of downtown Washington where there are these really very fancy old houses that have, that have become clubs and things now. Uh, and uh, one of them was on fire. And so she called it in and a photographer ran over and took a great picture, it was on the front page. And she called me the next day and she said, that's my picture, that's my fire. <laughs> she was so excited about it, so excited. She loved journalism. Uh, and uh, uh, and, uh, and it was, it was a, you know, a, a, a source of, of, uh, of other kinds of tips when I was a national editor and then managing editor, executive editor. You know, she would have these really great dinners. Sometimes I would be invited to them where you could pick up information. But if I wasn't there or if I was on her travels around the world and she picked up information, she called me with tips. Uh, all the time. It was very, 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 very helpful because she was very well plugged in. So then when I, uh, I when I got married to, to Janice, uh, uh, now 23 years ago, I think, um, uh, uh, Janice's father died shortly after our marriage. And as a result, a uh, uh, a, a party that had been scheduled by one of my one of my friends for, for after the marriage or a wedding party uh, was canceled. Uh, Mrs. Graham called me up and she said, you're going to come to my house for a wedding dinner. When you tell me the time is right, when the morning's over, you're going to come. And sure enough, she had a wonderful dinner for us, our relatives, our friends, and, uh, and so some of the uh, important people I knew around Washington. Great story. Um, what do you make of the post since you left with its newsroom under the leadership of Marty Barron of Spotlight fame? Marty was the editor of the Boston Globe for many years, um, you know, and now under the ownership of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. I'm very impressed. First of all, uh, I, I went to the meetings uh, that, uh, that Bezos had after he first bought the newspaper uh, and attended the meetings where he told the staff uh, that uh, uh, two important messages. One was that he had a long runway, as he put it, to invest in whatever was necessary in the newspaper uh, to assure its future, its future in the internet age. And the second was he was gonna have absolutely nothing to do with the, uh, with the news coverage, with the news content. Uh, and he's kept that, he's kept both those promises and the paper's prospering as a result uh, with a lot of innovation, a lot of digital innovation. Uh, and he's kept his hands completely off, uh, off the news coverage. Uh, and, and, and as you can see, if you read the post regularly, there's often investigative reporting about Amazon in it too, yeah. with, it, with always the explanation in, with the, somewhere within the story that Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Marty's just been a great editor. Uh, he's, he's done great investigative reporting. Uh, 
Uh, he, yeah, he's he's done he just, lots of other terrific coverage. He's greatly expanded the newsroom. He's expanded the subjects that the newsroom covers, uh, and has just been an outstanding editor. He's retiring at the end of this month, and uh, I'm I'm sad that he's retiring. I understand. I'm sad he, too. <laughs> he's tired. He says, and I, he's told me this personally, and I understand it. Uh, and uh, and I hope they're able to find a a, a good uh, a, a suitable uh, successor to him because he's just done an outstanding job. Any bets on who that might be? I, I've got some thoughts, both both thoughts of people I think I would like to see there, but I'm not going to share them publicly. Okay. All right. Well, last question from Julia. What are you doing now besides teaching at ASU? And she also says, thanks for the book. It was, it was a very interesting read and you've had a remarkable life. Good. Well, that's very kind of her to say that. Uh, I, I, I am teaching I, uh, and I continue to, uh, I'm writing another report for the Committee to Protect Journalists. I'm probably going to think of still another book to write at some point. I've written seven so far. Uh, and, uh, and I do, and I definitely am starting a big project, but I don't know what's going to happen to it. I don't know if it's going to be a book or what it's going to be on, uh, on the future of local news in the United States. I want to, I want to, uh, I'm doing research into all the ways that people are trying to save local news and I want to make, uh, the world know about that. Great. All right. Well, I think with that, we will, uh, wrap it up here, Len. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, for participating in this. I really enjoyed your book as well. And it's sitting in my personal library along with all the other great books on journalism. And to everyone out there in the audience, thank you so much for tuning in for this month's Beyond the Page book club. And again, a special thanks to Len, not only for joining us today, but for giving us a sneak peek of newsroom nuances for some of the most influential stories of our time. And then you can join us in coming weeks as we take a dive into our March selection. We'll be reading The Stationery Shop by Marjan Kamali. This virtual conversation will take place Monday, March 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. And now for another quick message from Sarah on how you can show your support. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much, Len. Thanks, Tina. Hello again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening and a very special shout out to today's virtual attendees who are GBH members. All donations from viewers, listeners, and virtual event attendees help keep us going. Today, we have a special offer for attendees who would like to become a GBH supporter. If you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, you will receive an autographed copy of The Stationery Shop by Marjan Kamali as a token of our appreciation. You, yes you, can help bring more stories to light on TV, radio, digital, and virtual platforms. Please visit wgbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH to 800-492-1111 to make a donation right from your cell phone. Just follow the information that you see in our chat to be brought to our site. Please donate today in any amount. And now more than ever, your commitment makes a difference. Thanks so much for attending tonight. Thanks again, Sarah. We look forward to connecting with all of you again. And we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time. Good night, everybody.